Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, welcome to Behavioral Insights and Design Thinking. My name is Ashley Breckenridge, and I'm a behavioral science advisor uh, at BETA. I've had the pleasure of coordinating the design thinking session thus far, uh, so I'm looking forward to being your facilitator for today's chat. I'll let the speakers introduce themselves properly, but I'll give you a bit of an overview of who's coming up on stage today. So we're gonna start with Nina Terry, uh, partner and chief methodologist at ThinkPlace, and as you'll know from our plenary, also our main facilitator here at BX for day two. We'll then hear from Deputy Secretary Hong Yun Poon from the Ministry of Manpower in Singapore, uh, before inviting our other panelists, Jana McCann, director at BizLab at the Department of Industry, Innovation and Science, uh, and Mukul Agrawal from the Department of Human Services uh, up onto the stage uh, and we'll have a bit of a panel discussion. So uh, we'll use these presentations that we'll start off seeing as a bit of a launch for our discussion afterward. For now, please welcome me in that joining, well, sorry, please welcome Nina to the stage. Ah, oh, here it is! <laughs> yes! Thank you, thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Nina. Okay, so welcome. Thank you for coming to this session. Um, so I'm switching gears now from um, being your MC and facilitator to uh, sharing, uh, I guess, my insight and my expertise around being a design thinker. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here, and um, my intent is actually to open up, and I think. I was thinking a lot about the presentation around how to locate design thinking in light of reference to behavioural insights, behavioural economics. So I've done my best not to defend or position either methodology, but to understand what does it mean if we think of the two together. So just a very quick backstory. So I'm one of the um, early founders of ThinkPlace. Um, it started in Canberra. Um, it's now a global uh, design company. And increasingly, um, our work is taking us to all sorts of fascinating problem spaces, not just um, government policy, um, but big, significant um, sustainable development goal challenges such as malnutrition. And it means that we are increasingly seeing the value proposition of many methods to help solve very, very complex problems. I like this diagram. If you haven't seen it, you should Google it, print it, stick it up somewhere near you. So if someone called a design thinker comes near you, you can say, right, OK, let's get ready. Because I use this diagram as a way to say this is the emotional journey of most things, but in particular design. So design is actually making you get into the complexity and the messiness at the beginning. Um, and I'm actually pretty proud of the fact that you are trying to hold people back from thinking what is the answer. Um, Damon Newman, who actually is the author of this, um, we have met and he said, look, go for it, use my diagram. We actually have this painted on every studio that we have across the world to remind everyone this is actually what design is about. I do actually like opening most of my presentations with this quote because I think it's pertinent at any point in time. And it's really critical that as we go about our endeavours to make change and impact, that we just have to constantly challenge the way we think about them and the methods in which we use them. I'm reading a fabulous book at the moment called Factfulness. It's on Bill Gates' uh, most uh, uh, noted books to read, um, and it's brilliant. And it's actually all about, um, I guess, the data perspective, but the biases we bring about not actually really knowing or we think we know what's actually happening around us. But I like this quote because I want this quote and the next one to be something to take into this particular session, which is we need to look at problems from multiple perspectives and we need to make sure we have multiple tools in our toolbox and we don't think that everything, the things that we believe in firmly are the only way to solve it. I also love this quote here. I'm a huge, huge fan of data. I have needed data to test my hypothesis, but the hypothesis themselves often emerge from talking to, listening to, and observing people. And I think both design and behavioral insights economics does that. And I think there's some um, particular strengths we both bring in that area. So my talk is actually gonna cover three areas. How might we understand design thinking and BI? I will apologise now, I do have an academic strain in my body, which means that I have come from a bit of a, how do I compare and contrast on some principles around the two? 
I do have a session around how can we be friends, which I think is actually very important. And I have some nice anecdotes from um, a very good colleague of mine in Kenya, and I will be talking about a case study which has recently achieved um, an international recognition of a great project that has actually shown how design thinking and behavioural economics have worked together very well. So how might we understand design thinking and behavioural insights? So I've put together this um, particular table and I've referenced a number of things, both lived experience, but there's two great reports I did come across if you haven't seen them from OECD in the last 12 months. One of which was saying how fantastic behavioural insights is. Another one of which says how fantastic design is. So I thought, brilliant, we've got two sources here uh, from a credible organisation um, trying to understand when and how we might use it. So some of the perspectives I brought here do come from there. Um, it is important to understand what is the worldview or the epistemological perspective we come from. It's not to say one is right or wrong, they are different. So if I think the world is socially constructed in terms of how it understands itself, and someone is coming from a positivist need to say how generalizable is this, we could get into a bit of a fight. Because I might say on this side of the mountain it is true. You might say, but is it true on the other side of the mountain? I might say, I don't care. It's true for here and I have to solve the problem here. So the reason why these things are important to raise is not to actually be concerned about those, but to understand those differences and that's where we come from. The problem solving process is also very important. There are huge value propositions with design, which is the abductive process of, I don't have any complete information sets. It's quite impartial. I'm actually almost gonna make it up. That freaks people out who wanna have some data. <laughs> or go, I wanna start with something. I wanna deduct it, I wanna induce it. So as a result of that, we can find there are some you know, natural tensions that exist because the way we might perceive how to solve something. The process is also important. And I have read that you know, from a behavioural insights economics point of view, um, the opportunities you know, to you know, improve or extend the kind of sense of collaboration in the process. But a very base principle, design thinking is fundamentally about it being participatory. It's dialectic and it's actually about co-designing and co-creating with others. Often those being researched almost become re researchers, which again for some might be like, whoa, hang on, that's a divide I'm not comfortable with. But in design thinking, we actually think quite consciously about that in terms of bringing the others in. And your expert collaboration is something to admire, something that says, where else can we draw something from? It actually also can mean how you interact with the users of the system can be somewhat different to design thinking. Um, the actual problem domain is interesting, and this could be a bit contentious me saying this, and it could be just where some of the examples of VR have been focused. But design thinking can tend and play in very ambiguous, broad spaces, um, and BI can be tended to focus on more bounded parts of a system to see how it might be more efficient or effective. That's not good or bad, right or wrong. Um, that is sort of where I think some of the discipline is up to. Um, the expertise is interesting, so I won't go into the list there, but if you were to smash two teams in a room of design and BI or BE, you've got to recognise they're just different discourses, different backgrounds, and so what it means is if you actually looked across the two sets, that's a really fascinating group of people that are pretty smart, have got different ways of seeing the world and trying to understand how do we navigate complexity. My couple of points on outcome, you might say, well, she's making some big calls there. Again, it's just some examples. Um, I, I, from a design thinking point of view, there's a potential to disrupt and to reframe and think completely differently, agnostic to any evidence existing at all, is one of the value propositions. Um, and also the ability to activate a network of actors. So it's not just this sort of binary or simplicity of potentially simplicity of like a policy maker, a researcher and a user, but what is that whole system has to enact the ability to make a change actually happen. And also that the citizen is highly located in the central process. Um, that said, my understanding of Braveheart Insights and see it in action is that you work very hard at building a strong rig around some proven interventions and how they might work. And as this morning's discussions were raising, you know, there are genuine conversations about how do you scale, how do you get the right evidence base. And so it's bringing some really important data points and evident packages to the conversation in policy making. Um, and I think you're very interested in understanding the scale of popul at a population level, which I think is hugely valuable. So let me just do a bit of a zoom on a couple of those uh, rows. So this idea that design um, sees knowledge as socially constructed means that we actually fundamentally go, who do we actually need to invite into our design process? Where do we find them? How do we best actually engage them on their terms, not on our terms? Um, and how might we actually invite them in 
almost every step of the way, not just problem definition, but exploring, looking at possibilities, intervention and designing, and then in somewhat getting them to almost test and evaluate how things are going. Again, that's a little bit different to where potentially BI is coming from. So what that actually means is that I might comfortably start in a position where I actually go, I know nothing. I don't want to read anything about homelessness or the effect of something on a population because I actually want to start with a clean mind. So from a design perspective, the openness for emergence uh, and really seeking out new perspectives, almost holding back to say, what can I find in the problem of interest? So it's really focusing this idea of constructing new knowledge. So that means because of that, we are actually empowering people to be part of that process. Um, and that actually is interesting because what it throws into a design thinking process is that because you're working with others, not to, you've got a responsibility to build their capacity about how they think and about how they make sense of things. And I'll make it very clear, you never give people what they want. <laughs> okay, I have heard um, not so well educated comments about design being, well, what they want, you know, we gave them what they want. That's not the purpose. We all would know that as good researchers, right? From what we see or observe, there's more we have to do to go underneath that. Um, but the whole idea is that we are very keen to empower people's participation. So they learn something. I've heard that as a message this morning. Every time we do something, yes, there is the, the problem and the space, but have we actually learned something as research and as people who constantly try to design change? So as a quick example, and I won't have time to go through the whole project, but we have been dealing with a very complex issue that's unfortunately in lots of societies. There's been lots of reports, but how do we deal with domestic violence in our communities? So the, the Zoom I'll just take on this particular project just to kind of amplify this idea of you actually don't have really any theory to go to. And in particular in this challenge, you don't even have any data. You're actually dealing with people who aren't even reporting that they're having any incidences of actually experiencing any violence. So how do you actually invite in an unknown population? You can't even find them. You can't even access them. So part of what design thinking does well in this particular project, it took six months just to take the time to understand who is in the community, where can we actually find them, in a way that actually is sensitive and appropriate. So we start at that point, which is often helpful, which is the frontline worker perspective and how might that actually invite some understanding of stories. But over time, we eventually built trust in a very uh, not much trust environment, but also um, a lot of sensitivities to the point that we're actually able to work with Aboriginal and other culturally uh, sensitive communities in ways that actually was quite empathetic to how they need to communicate. So we got a bus. We went around Canberra and we collected young mums and elders with their children and they didn't know each other and we had a storytelling session to say what's actually happening, what's occurring in your lives. They loved it so much, they said, can we do this every week? This actually be quite therapeutic. So sometimes in co-design, you actually almost discover an intervention by the very nature of the research process that you actually try to create because you don't yet know what the best way is to understand the lived experience. But on that particular project, I guess the stage of inviting people in including ministers, including key stakeholders, including people who own the budgets and so forth, it actually enabled a very important staging process to talk about how policy might change. So that's all I'll say about that project, was to say that there is this really important, we were constructing an understanding with the social to say what is actually going on. Now the problem solving logic is the fact that whoever is in the process, just like if you're in the process, um, you know, there is actually something going on. There's a reasoning process that's actually happening. So when it actually comes to, so sort of moving from that exploration and insights about what's happening, when it comes to that, well, what are the ideas and possibilities for change? There's something that designers do which can also upset people who need evidence. We improvise. <laughs> we just go, well, what if we did this? Well, I have no idea. I've never seen it before. I've got no idea if it's done in Denmark before or if it's done in the US. I don't know. So part of this is that it's actually a really important place where design thrives. Um, and because of that, this abductive nature, it actually is really essential when there's actually no clear path forward. And you've got a lot of players at hand who might have competing <coughs> ideas and views about what actually we might need to do. So this idea of conjecture, proposing something new, and also that you may be more willing to pose more radical ideas to a context. It doesn't just happen because you think radical. It's the process of inquiry. It's the questions we ask. It's actually how deep we actually go from what we've actually observed. And what's very interesting, I found this quite a powerful um, way of challenging experts. Um, and how does design thinking help even experts reframe? 
and I've had the absolute pleasure of working in the energy space for the last two years. And I say pleasure because I have no idea what kilowatts are. I have no idea about how those electrons fly around. All I know is that I charge my iPad every night. I happen to drive a Tesla, so I go, okay, it goes. But the fascinating thing is this is a highly expert domain, right? And so the big challenge here was actually around how do we increase the adoption of renewable energy? Not at the consumer end. I'll make this very clear. This is actually the system level. So what was actually happening, and this is actually a couple of years ago, this work was commissioned by the Australian Renewable Energy Agency. And they brought us on as a design partner, a bit of an outlier. They thought, well, what are we going to do here? What can be done? But fundamentally, what we said is everything at the moment signifies transaction, analysis, paralysis, this whole idea that it, there are formal channels and all these formal approaches. This is a system-wide challenge. So part of the proposition was say, what if you were to collaborate? What if we would actually be more proactive rather than kind of go from the problem out? What if we thought differently? And how might we actually engage the stakeholders to have the deliberations that they're just not having now in the typical meetings and forums? And actually, how could we even accelerate action because everyone's waiting for someone else to move? And the reason why I'm giving this example around the abductive process is that we actually said, you can stop all your debates and issues about why we can't do anything today. We said, we're actually going to leap over that. We're actually going to go all the way to the future where we actually all agree. Policymakers, regulators, the industry, entrepreneurs, startups, consumers, where do we all agree? So we all agreed that we want a low carbon future. We all agreed that we need social equity in terms of how we access a very common resource to life. And we also said it has to be viable, reliable, pretty critical stuff. And there has to be some sense of competition. We don't want to actually sort of bring things to a flattening. And what was very interesting is saying, well, what sort of future might that actually be? What would we need to see to be there? So we spent time actually over a couple of periods of, couple of, periods of months of time actually reframing the view of what actually is the energy system, not kilowatts and all these diagrams. If you Google the energy system, what do you get? Poles and wires, <laughs> chain of events, coal-fired stations. To say it's all about the citizen. So we thought about where does the consumer come in, the citizen, it's all changing. But then we ask the question, well, if the future is to be true, because not here yet, what must exist? And we came up with six innovation frames. I'm saying this very quickly. It took a bit of time to get there. But the point was it was co-created co, co amongst the people that it mattered with, the whole system. And I think this is where design thinking actually provides a really important entree to setting the scene, I think, to the right interventions to make change. As a subsequence to this over the last couple of years, we've actually been running a number of what we call innovation labs. So design can actually work very well at the whole. So we convene almost up to almost this size room almost every couple of months, and we actually tackle a frame. This particular diagram, this is part of a report we developed. It's online. You could actually Google ARENA, an A-Lab uh, report. And it is a, a quick visual to say in two years, that number of 36 million is actually now 50 million. We've actually managed to distribute grant money to front edge R&D type projects that are trying to break down some barriers to how renewable energy can be adopted. Highly technical some of these are. I couldn't repeat them to you. But the point is they're actually breaking uh, new territory and they're also enabling new partnerships and a whole reforming and reorganising of the sector. So if you think about design thinking, trying to tackle that sort of how do people talk as one level and make change happen, this is an example of that. Um, the nature in which we think about the types of problems, you may have come across the Kinefin model um, by Snowden and Boone, um, it is useful because if you think about these different domains of problems, there are different methods that help solve them. Whenever you're in a problem space, you've got to stand in the middle of that. The reason why this was developed is to say, it's no such thing as only one or the other, but if you stand in the middle, one moment you could say, that's a type of problem that's simple, it's got to get a bit of best practice on that. Another point you might go, hmm, that's a bit complicated, let's break that down, I need some experts to help me with that. Hmm, that's actually really got no idea how to tackle it, we've actually got to get some ability to unearth an emergence of what's possible. And then you've actually got chaotic, oh gosh, this thing's happening, things are burning down, got to get something done, it's rapid response. And different disciplines and organisations actually can tend to hover in different parts of that. Design thinking we have found has been helpful, especially in partnerships with other methods, I think we're actually really good at the designing of the emergence. So what is possible? The ability to say, let's discover, but let's probe to learn to act. And you could argue that's what you do as well. Um, there's an interesting partnership there. But there's something about that ability to see things as complex. The other diagram, which I really like, just the big takeaway is, if you ask yourselves a couple of questions, or when would you use design? This axis is great. So this is a Stacey model. And it's like, to what extent are you certain about where you need or how you might need to intervene? To what extent do we have agreement? 
Now, it depends on who is the who in your question, in terms of who you're asking those questions to, because you can have three of you and say, we're highly certain, I've got agreement, let's crack on with it, shall we? But we might go, oh, hang on, that's a bit scary, they haven't thought about that. Um, but the idea is that where you need to find yourself in a highly deliberative space, where you need to genuinely debate and explore, design thinking has a lot of tools to really help enable that. Um, I thought on a Saturday night I'd do something interesting and read the budget papers, which is no slight on my personality. Um, but my well, budget paper four, it's a fabulous little section that actually really, and it, I didn't take the quote from your own discipline, but from the design thinking point of view, you know, really called out the need for design thinking methodologies for very complex problems. And equally, it talks about behavioural in insights and the rigour we need for evidence to make decisions. So we are deeply located in the minds of our policymakers and our ministers, which is fantastic. Um, just a couple of points, and I'll move into the um, case study. Um, but look, it's really important to think about whenever we think about design, we think, think about activating four voices. And all four voices need to be present in the design process in our experience. If any one of these are missing, it's suboptimal. The voice of intent, who's driving this, what's the need, who is that sponsor, who's carrying this forward? That can often be more than one. Who is the voice of expertise? You know, who brings expertise from the system and understanding? Who is the voice of experience? Staff, intermediaries, end users, the network, the system in action. And then who is the voice of design? So bringing in different design expertise into the equation. So we actually assemble that sort of team every time we run a design thinking process. And I don't know how you assemble your teams in your, the BI context, but there's something about really bringing in an assembly of many that actually goes a long way to get, bring people along on the journey. Um, you may be familiar with the design thinking model. This is a model that we use. Um, it has fractals. You can do it at a whole big scale policy perspective and then it can come right down to a project level. But the idea is that you know, clarifying what is the intent is really critical. Exploring, innovating and iterating those prototypes that you come up with, evaluating and recommending. The main point is that who you bring along on that journey. So we don't necessarily have people coming in and out. We actually say, how do we bring people consistently through that process? So it's almost like a de de the ability to bring agency to every stage of that in terms of who you're trying to bring onto the project or the problem. Um, I'm going to flick past that one just because I want to actually then tell you, I did a bit of a tricky little exercise about, well, how are we going to be friends? So a first statement I thought I'd make um, from Dean, who is our studio lead in Kenya, He's worked for a number of years with an outstanding behavioural uh, economics firm and he said, you've got to look for the common goal. If you think about it, uh, we're all here to understand human behaviour and also ultimately make a difference. And I think that's actually very important. So if you find yourself in a room with a design thinker going, Ugh, or I'm in the right room with, with, with a behavioural insights person, but just step back and go, what is it that we both can bring to this challenge about understanding humans and people and collectives and solving the problem? I love this quote. This is what Dean said to me. He said, in the beginning, if any of us contradicted each other from different methods, it was like a fight. It's all on for real. So who's right? Oh, I'm right. No, you're right. <laughs> so there's something about the honesty that when different methods come into practice, um, you actually just need to go, well, what is that? So the way that he's actually framed that, which I think is just fabulous, he's saying we actually love it if there's a contradiction between what something has come out of the team that we're working with from a BI perspective and design. And I'll give you an example. So in the case that I'm about to share with you, um, they, we did a whole lot of qualitative uh, deep research uh, understanding the particular user experience and our BE partners did um, some really fantastic uh, survey work. One of the things that came out of the survey work is that young women said, it's all to do with sex work, said, oh, we are always protected. Tick, tick that box. In the qualitative research, no one at all had said for a particular cohort that we um, practice sex, safe sex. And so it wasn't to say, it, you could have said, well, who's right, who's wrong? But that wasn't the point. It was to say, what is actually going on there? And so again, at one level, go, well, that's kind of might be a bit obvious to work that out, but it's in the moments. When you're doing a project, when the rubber hits the road and you're putting evidence on the table and looking at things midway through, it's actually the process that you go through. I think that we owe it to the client, the problem space, the policymaker, the actual end user, that we actually work hard to say, but what is going on there? What do we mean? So I just love this point. Look for contradictions. It's a bit paradoxical, but really embrace them.
Now, this is very busy, but I had a crack at what I thought I could overlay a, a view about how you might be going through your methodology overlaid with the design thinking methodology. I'll just cover a couple of points that I wanted to, again, not to emphasise right or wrong, but where I think there's some interesting points to understand. So, again, I've emphasised the participatory nature from a design point of view. When it comes to defining the outcome, where we start our projects, I thought this was interesting. And I must admit, I did a bit of homework. I've um, got a colleague in New Zealand. Um, he is just phenomenal. He's a behavioural economist, has worked for the government previously, done some fantastic work. So I tested some of my slides with him just to make sure I wasn't making any too bold a claim. So I wanted to be very fair. In design, we tend to focus the outcome quite broadly in terms of the system or the context of the policy intent. There can be a tendency, not saying always, but in behavioural insights, it might be more around what is the stimulus to change the system behaviours. It's not right or wrong, but it's just about where do you start your actual problem from is an opportunity to think about. Um, the exploration, be fair to say, design is really big about the lived experience, getting deep stories, case studies, rich descriptions, empathy building, and really building empowerment of participants in that process. I understand that you do that as well. You do gather insights, you do observe, you want to understand what's happening in action. I don't know how long you spend doing that. I don't know. But one of the things that we emphasise is taking time to really understand what is going on for people. Um, when it comes to the innovation and co-designing, I think philosophically, I would never just sit in a corner, I'm not saying that you do this, but as a designer, sit there and kind of come up with an idea and cook it up. It's always in action with someone else. So that earlier project I mentioned about domestic violence, we are co-creating and developing up different prototypes together. I think the main point, because I think I need to start to wrap up, um, is that I actually think there's a lovely interaction um, that as we try to prototype those interventions, I think what BO does beautifully, and, and this next story I will tell, and I'll wrap it up so the rest of the panel can, can join me, um, is actually bringing some hard evaluation objective measures to prototypes as we go through a design thinking process. And I think that's actually where there's a lot of value in getting some of that more rapid iterative evaluation and con, you know, evidence that supports some of the um, prototyping processes in design. How much time do I have, Ashley? Am I okay? Okay, so I did actually put together a slide I thought that might be helpful, which is just to synthesise those messy two diamonds, which is, well, what can behavioural insights give to design and what can design give to behavioural insights? So I think from a behavioural insights point of view, and I mentioned this numeric and quantifiable base um, to evidence the effect of a stimulus it would be hugely valuable. And I think doing that in a very agile way is really critical. That, that discipline of actually designing and gathering evidence would be very valuable in the design thinking process. And I think also just the ability to be comparative. I didn't add it there, but I think there's also about how you think about the population, actually understanding at scale what we're actually meaning and representation. From a design thinking point of view to behavioural insights, this ability to empower users in the system of the actors and explore and innovate at stages. So really embracing, and it's a very different skill set. So what I do pretty much every day is work with people. I get exhausted, I go running on my own to get my energy back, but the point is you are constantly collaborating. Um, and so that's something that perhaps could be a, a huge thing to bring into the process of BI. Improvisation, reimagining, and deep disruptive framing um, of the current state is something that design almost deliberately does. It's looking for how might we think completely differently about this problem space. So in the domestic violence point, we pushed the problem space and participants, not just from how can we get people who need help to access the help they need and use existing systems, but we pushed it further to say, what if violence did not exist in the future? Does not exist. How might we think about the world if it didn't exist? And it opened up some very interesting ideas of possibilities. That energy has been misdirected what if we thought about energy being misdirected? Like, so this whole idea that you're actually fundamentally always challenging very early on, even where you start to think you might need to intervene to do something. Um, and I think the rapid solutioning and prototyping uh, where there's no evidence, um, again, that's a bit contested, but the whole idea is how do you actually do that so you can learn rapidly? There might be some interesting entrees into do something that's a bit more um, built up. Um, just two very last quick slides, and I may even use the case study in the story of the panel. Um, but basically, we should together be enabling deeper learning when it comes to design solutions. This is, a, this is a whole lecture in itself around the triple loop learning. I just love it. But the point is, is that we owe it to our clients. We owe it to the outcome and the problem space. And it's actually a skill set that is being called upon by secretaries across government. 
because that skill to think deeply is really critical. And we've got to lift the bar around that if we're going to make a difference across our portfolios. The other one which is really important, where do you put your eggs in a, an organisation? I believe between the two methods we can help create a balanced portfolio of projects that bring change. And that's so important. So I think we should celebrate wherever BI is spending its time at the moment. It's fantastic. Wherever design thinking is spending its time, that's fantastic. How do we kind of move together, I think, to actually help organisations build those portfolios that make a difference? So that's where I was going to leave it. And I can talk about the case study potentially through the deliberations of the panel, just so we can give that time. Would that be helpful? Great. Thank you. No problem. Feel free to have a seat on the stage. Great. Thank you very much. All right. I'll now uh, please ask our other panelists to please come up to the stage and join me. And I will exit. Let's see if Up this you. works. Did it. All right. I'll now ask a Hong Yun Poon to come to the stage. Yeah. Oh, pen. Can't see a pen. Oh, here it is. <laughs> Got it. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Do so some introduction just, um, or just, <coughs> just go on? Here? Just, okay. Okay. There we go. Good. Thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us for this session. Thank Australia for being a wonderful host and organizers, organizers for having me to, to share uh, what we've done in the Ministry of Manpower. Just a little bit about uh, myself. Uh, I just joined MOM not too long ago, so I'm not a very experienced practitioner. I oversee an experienced team of practitioners doing BI and uh, DT and also uh, um, data analytics. Uh, MOM itself, um, we have been doing, well, we started off with design thinking, actually around 2009, so, so almost 10 years ago. Uh, got some very good results. Um, and uh, five years later, decided to, to also get into um, um, behavioral uh, insights. Uh, and also along the way, uh, data analytics. So we thought, well, just as any practical, uh, pragmatic Singapore organization would do, why not put all three together, right? So <laughs> Nina talked about uh, BI plus uh, DT, so we decided to throw in DA uh, into the mix as well. Um, how has it worked for us? Um, so far, um, we tried, well, we, we have a framework called, we call it UDT, uh, Understand, Design, Test, and you can see that actually, um, I'll just show it all. Uh, you can see that actually all three methods have some form of understanding the, the customer, uh, as uh, Nina mentioned, and uh, also design and test. But of course, the difference being that Nina has also uh, expounded in much greater detail and uh, with, with greater expertise. Uh, you, you can expect that in data analytics and uh, BI, there's a lot more data, uh, whereas for DT, you go to a more, I won't say deeper, but more personal level with, with the customer to understand the situation, to get insights. And that helps in the design process and, uh, and, 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 and uh, in terms of testing, uh, some different methods bring in different uh, viewpoints as well. Uh, so we don't have a very sort of a very, because we are not a, a scientific institution or research institution, we don't have a very fixed method, we don't write papers. So basically, we just have problems to solve. Uh, at any one time, we are working on 10 projects, uh, big and small, and we just figure out how to work along, how the team get along as we just throw them in the same room, as Nina said. We just throw them all in the same, they were in different rooms. So we throw them all in the same room and we, we get them to figure out how to work together. And it's, it's worked well so far. So far. Uh, so a little bit uh, about, I, I thought maybe to share two very quick case studies. The, the scope of work for MOM is actually very wide. Uh, it touches on uh, uh, labor, manpower issues. Uh, we deal with foreign workers as well. Uh, peculiar, peculiar characteristic of the Singapore economy is that one third of our labor force is actually foreign. You know, so, so actually it's quite a few issues there we deal with. We also deal with workplace safety. Right? What, what we do is that our, our inspectors actually go out to construction sites, for example, to check whether uh, the, the companies are, are having a safe workplace practices, because this, this can cost lives, as you can imagine. 
So, so what we did was um, um, basically have uh, just trying to use this example to illustrate the different methods. We have uh, design anal analytics to sort of figure out which are the work sites we should target in terms of inspection. Because right now, or previously, uh, what we do is we inspect all work sites equally, which doesn't quite make sense, right? So, so all some work sites deserve better attention from us. So, so we use data analytics and we use technology as well, uh, sensors, uh, uh, video analytics. As you can see, we are agency that. It's very open to trying out a lot of new stuff. Um, and also uh, look at the enforcement interactions itself through design thinking uh, to drive behavioral change. A little bit more detail. Um, the letter that you, you, you can't read from here, but you can see that this is a letter that we sent out to the companies, and it's very colorful. Uh, actually, many all, all letters from um, Ministry of Mum that we send out to our citizens are very colourful and it's part of BI because it, it sort of draws attention and, and so on, salience, right? Um, and uh, we found out from our design thinking interviews with, with our own inspectors and also with companies that uh, the letters that we sent to the safety officers in the companies were not really very impactful, uh, that we should send it to the CEO, so we, we did. And we, we send it to the management and we, we, the, the, the bar that you see with a bit of red colour and yellow and green basically is, is the, the landscape of uh, uh, companies in that sector uh, in terms of the safety scores. And the arrow that you see, if you can see above the, the bar, is where the company is at. Right? So, so this is where we tell them that, look, this, your company is, is very bad in terms of uh, safety scoring and by the way, we're coming to check you. <laughs> so, so actually, it captures the attention uh, because the, actually there was an interesting discussion yesterday. There was, uh, I think, a discussion with, uh, uh, um, I think one of, I can't remember which session, but somebody said, look, I have a parking ticket and I can't see in terms of cost benefit how it works for the government because they just collected uh, less fines because of nudging. But actually, for, for us, it's, it's very clear. We don't want to collect the fines. We don't want to charge the companies in, in, in court. We would much, much rather they engage in safe practices at work because it impacts lives. Life is a life and death situation. Right? So, so it, we find that it's, it, the letter was, was impactful. And we also talked to our inspectors to, to see how they can do their jobs better. Because we found out from, again, the safety officers in the companies that, look, when your inspectors talk to us, uh, or when we talk to our company management, they don't listen to us. But when the Ministry of Mum, uh, uh, Mum uh, uh, officers talk to the uh, CEO, they really, really listen. Right? You're ten times more effective. So we, we do work with the, the safety officers to see what sort of messages we should bring across, across to the management. Right? Um, and uh, this is something new that we did. Uh, because we, after the inspection, we send the management another letter to say this is where you went wrong and this is what you should do mm -hmm. right, to complete the feedback loop. And we found that actually there was great reduction in the, in the, in, when we do the uh, RCT, uh, that the treatment group had uh, um, much more reduction in enforcement actions needed uh, compared with the control. And also because of data analytics, we actually don't use as, as much uh, resources to inspect the companies. So that's great. But qualitative findings were also important because uh, a company management, we found out actually they care a lot about how the company is doing. And because of that, they take uh, the enforcement actions more seriously, right? Takes uh, 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 workplace safety a lot more seriously. And even our own inspectors, when we started on this process, they were skeptical. Would this work? And sometimes, really, it's not about con convincing uh, senior management, it's also convincing the ground whether this method works. And I think at the end of it, they had very good feedback that uh, they found that they were much more effective in terms of doing their work. Uh, there are many more projects that we, that we do, and I'll, I'll be very happy to share uh, and to learn from you uh, uh, what, what would you do in this area. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. So we're going to go into a bit of a panel discussion now. Uh, so my job is to keep us to time. The panelists' jobs are to be punchy and interesting. <laughs> and your job is to think of some questions that you'd like to ask. Now, I want to try and use our Poll Everywhere platform to get some feedback from all of you. We'll get to that in a second, and I'll give you more instructions then. But in the meantime, 
start thinking about what you'd like to know more about. But I'd also love to um, hear a bit more from Jana and Mukul, who are also on stage with us. So it'd be great if you could tell us a little more about who you are, um, the work of your teams, and also if you have some reactions from the presentations that we've seen thus far, or some stories that, you know, that you're thinking of from your experience as well. That would be great to know. Um, Jana, we'll, we'll start with you if you'd like. Sure, thank you. Uh, my name is Jana McCann, as you, we've just said, and I'm the general manager of BizLab, Department of Industry, Innovation and Science, rolls off the tongue. <laughs> and I've been there now for about 18 months, going on two years. So my whole career has been in the private sector, marketing, innovation, uh, globally and locally, and I was brought in to set up the Innovation Lab. It's got two key remits. Uh, the first is a short-term impact, so to try and get the business to be more user-centric, user-focused, deliver more impactful outcomes immediately, get runs on the board. So we've been really working 24-7 to make that happen in the last 18 months. And the longer-term goal, which is really the hard one, is that cultural change to what we call that utopia of innovation mindset, whatever that is meant to mean. But um, embedding in the DNA, I think, a philosophy of user-centricity, experimentation, learning, uh, feedback loops, dissemination of information, that's the long game. So I don't consider myself in the game of human-centered design, um, beta, whatever it is. I consider myself in the game of change management, really. Right. We predominantly, in terms of our service offer at the moment, we, we think of ourselves as a startup. So if you look at a maturity curve, we're just coming out of startup. And for purposes of that, we've had to prove our worth. So instead of talking, we just did. Um, and so probably 85% of our resources so far have gone to working on projects. And we do that by working with subject matter experts like yourself. We bring them into our lab. It's a physical space. We work uh, under agile project management and philosophies as well. And a project may take, depending on the complexity of the project, a week to a year. It really depends. And they live with us full-time and do those projects mm -hmm. in cross-functional teams, which is, is key mm -hmm. to what you were saying. Um, so that's probably the most of what we do, and we transfer learning in doing so. So that's one way of scale and making this stuff stick, if you like. Our job isn't to do it. We are not an internal consultancy. If we do not get resources from the business, we don't even start. Uh, the second one is that we do a lot of facilitation and consultation, and it may be as simple as people coming to us telling us they're about to run a workshop and us simply, as, as you said again, Nina, reframing that problem, looking at, changing the lens that you're looking at, it can make a big difference. And thirdly, which we'll speak about, I think maybe at some point, is training. We've just launched a um, human centred design training academy where we're very, very big on saying it's not about human centred design, it's about the right tool for the job. Um, in terms of, I guess, my feedback on the two fantastic presentations, First of all, I'd like to say, Nina, I am friends with behavioural economics people. <laughs> <laughs> I think of us as symbiotic. I don't think of us as different whatsoever. I think from coming from the private sector, you don't think like that. It's just that we're structured like that a little bit. Um, DHS, which you'll hear, and the Ministry of Manpower, are very lucky that they have the scale that you've got all those um, expertise in one room. But that, that would be the key thing. I think for government, because of our silos, we need to really get that cross-matrix formation in place. So mm. that would be my thoughts. Great. Thank you. And Mukul? So um, I'm Mukul Agrawal. Um, my role is uh, Chief Citizen Experience Officer at Department of Human Services. So um, just to give you some breadth of that, so that's Centrelink, Medicare, Child Support Services, so quite extensive. Um, so I would say the, the whole function of customer and citizen um, has been there, obviously, for a long time at this department, <laughs> but in the last 12 months, I um, think more in earnest to really get customer at the centre, which is, you know, pleasing. And I've been there six months and it's been really pleasing to sort of enter a space where, you know, everyone's a customer, to be honest, uh, in the sense of um, Australians and really solving this. So I guess um, just to give you some context on the challenge, uh, you know, we're talking about something like 800 million touch points a year with the department, um, with, with Australians. Uh, we're talking about something like 200 projects at any given time in the department which have a pretty significant impact and change impact mm -hmm. on citizens. So in that breath, I guess, you know, the, this role of customer, um, I would say quite a big one, uh, but then really, you know, I, th I think uh, looking at the presentations and, the, and some of the methodologies becomes very apparent how you 
bring that into a department like this and apply it. Um, and I would say at a high level, and if I sort of comment on the presentations, what resonated is, you know, for me, the framework that I, that I think we're starting to really get behind is this framework of it's really about insights, possibilities, and measured outcomes. And for me, that's like your continuous loop and the triple loop system, I think, very relevant to that. Can't be just, you know, big systematic changes. It has to be interventions. Um, and really, for me, it's about those loops and how do you keep doing that. And I would say um, the, the way my teams are structured, and, you know, we've got some really mature practices. I would say the most mature is actually behavioral economics, which is really pleasing when I first entered the role that, wow, I've inherited this fantastic team that's been doing this for a while. Uh, but, but really three branches, as we call them. Um, and they're really around this framework of insights, possibilities, and outcomes. So first one is what I call, um, you know, the voice of the customer or research. And, you know, we do ethnographic, we do behavioral economics, and we're also starting to really look at customer measurement, you know, your classic sentiment, touch point sort of analysis. And for me, that's one team. Mm -hmm. And for me, you know, more and more, it's the insights from all three to see what's the so what mm -hmm. when we look at interactions or strategic sort of mm -hmm. systems. And for me, that's, I think, the power of this, that, you know, for mm. me, all have to play a role or, or bring different inferences. And it's about how those teams collaborate to help the businesses derive good insights to then create possibilities. Um, which comes to the second branch, which is, um, you know, what I call, you know, design or strategic design. And really, once again, I've, I've culminated all design into one team to say it's strategic as well as in moment, not to sort of separate that out, because once again, Sometimes when it's strategic, people perceive that as, well, that's just too far out. I mean, that's like years away. Um, thank you, but we'll explore the real challenges today. So I want this team to be able to go into the moment as much as strategic mm -hmm. and really use the voice of the customer to inform it at all levels. So once again, you know, strategic design, but design mm -hmm. capability centralised. And then finally, and probably the most important one for me, having been in different industries and tried to do customer experience a few times, delivery. I think this is the hardest part organisations find in terms of using all of this great infrastructure capability yeah. to actually show results, closing the loop, if you like. Yeah. Um, for me, the delivery team is really, um, I would say, specialist in facilitation, in understanding this value chain of customer, but then helping multidisciplinary teams and businesses to inculcate that in yeah. and then deliver effectively. Again. And then really being hard, I would say, also on, yeah, we didn't do this for fun. We actually did this for results. And you know, we're not taking this on or we're not adopting change. So sometimes you even deliver the thing, but there's no adopt adoption because we've left it too early. So this last part's probably, um, I would say, um, immature in many ways in the department, but also very mature. We've got design hubs, we've got the whole system up and infrastructure, infrastructure up, but the hardest bit is that adoption bit for me, and that's where I think the team's now focusing. How do we go in as change agents with that helping hand, but then also be the hard taskmaster around making sure we actually show change? Because suddenly I think customer experience disappears when you don't ch show change after a few years. And for me, that's a key focus, mm -hmm. that we sustain this and we really build all three branches as centres of excellence, which the department keeps, uh, you know, it's, it's a pull model rather than a push model. Mm -hmm. So, so that's, that's a vision. I actually think I'm very proud of the teams and the great work that they're already doing, but a, a long way to go to really, I think, systemise this and embed it across the department. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, now, I wanted to ask a broad question for all of you, so feel free to jump in. But we're at a behavioral exchange conference. Uh, we're in the design thinking session. 200 people registered for this session. It was the most popular of all the breakouts at behavioral exchange. Why do you think so many people want to know more about design thinking? Turn that over. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us. <laughs> I mean, because obviously this is something that you're all familiar with because it's mm. embedded within your teams. Do you think it's just a matter of this kind of budding friendship that, <laughs> you know, that you've mentioned? Is yeah. it just that it's become more in people's awareness? Well, I think it's a balance of any good... It's like there's sort of like these momentums around different methodologies and I think we're keen to understand that we're playing in similar spaces and I think I lecture and I get questions commonly asked from middle management, sort of band one, sort of uh, EL2 level... Um, when do I use it? Like, when, when do I use BEBI? When do I use design thinking? And yeah. I think people are after this sort of ability to have some way to discern 
is it right or wrong? And I, I think people are grappling with how might we be working together. I think it's a very important proposition, and it is happening. Mm. We're seeing that. Mm. Um, and I think we need to be able to translate each other's, which is part of my presentation, say, well, how do we translate where we come from? How do we actually communicate what we mean? And how might we best optimise, whether it's insight generation, whether it's about how do we understand the possibilities, where do we start with the problem space? Um, I do think it's about building the right language to communicate. Yeah. And I think this morning, um, with uh, Dr. David Gruen, you know, yeah. from Prime Minister and Cabinet, actually saying, look, in the day, our work goes to someone's desk mm. for decision making. Um, and I think it's really important we're able to position what came out of the design thinking effort, what came out of the BE effort. Um, and in the project, which I didn't cover here, but it was actually to do with um, how do we actually get, um, in this case, it was about an uptake of um, a particular medicine to reduce the likelihood of contracting HIV um, in East Africa. Um, and it won an international globe, you know, award for design research and strategy because they clearly articulated the value proposition of design thinking and the value proposition of um, behavioural economics. And I think it was about this quantification, sophisticated segmentation that BE brought, but the deep and richness of the qualitative understanding of lived experience and also how to prototype to change mm -hmm. was helpful in the partnership. Yeah. I, I, wonder, I wonder if, uh, I'm maybe generalising and oversimplifying, but I wonder whether people were having uh, a little bit of discomfort Maybe discomfort is too strong a word, but uh, for data analytics and BI to say, look, you look at things at a high level, a lot of data, and you seem almost like magic, you know, yeah. you're supposed to figure out whether things work or not. And uh, design thinking has that element of getting closer to the customer and figuring out sometimes the why, why something sometimes like, like this happened. I think intuitively we feel that the two can fit together. And I think that's, that's where the interest comes from. Yeah. Others? Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. It's about the why of, of where it fits together. I mean, we can look at uh, data and know the what, but we don't really know what's driving it. Um, and I always say to my team, like, we're, we're constantly working on the narrative as well internally about where does data analytics, where does foresighting, where does behavioural economics all fit together. People get very hung up on the terminology. Um, I always say get hung up on the problem that you're trying to solve, first of all, and you had some mm. great slides in there about complexity of the problems, etc. And I, you don't all have to be practitioners on this sort of stuff. You know, you've got different centres of excellence, like your structure as well. We've got great suppliers mm. that you can come to. Think of it more as a qualitative and quantitative and how they complement each other is how I like to think of it. Mm -hmm. Where do you get the insights? How do you test together a prototype, fail fast, and give the best mm -hmm. evidence that you can, evidence advice, and that learning loop as well. So mm -hmm. I just say, don't, get, don't, don't worry about it. You know, but, uh, design thinking as an example, it's just a term that was coined, you know, a little <laughs> while back by IDEO over in the States, a design company. Mm -hmm. um, marketers have been doing this since the dawn of time. You know, it's just speaking to people, asking mm -hmm. what they want, but giving them what they need, <laughs> um, and, and working with them to develop things. It's mm -hmm. not rocket science, and I just say don't get hung up on those those terms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll reiterate the same thing. So intuitively, I think whenever you do presentations such as today or anything on design or behavioural economics, I think I haven't mm -hmm. seen a single person who doesn't quite resonate with it. Mm -hmm. I think the challenge here is, um, I would say, um, practical and pragmatic yeah. execution, which is hard because sometimes you get, and we all do it, we all get caught up in certain concepts and we love it and we can't wait to apply it. But, you know, if you go back to the business world, um, you know, business sponsors or, you know, um, even executives, mm -hmm. ultimately they've, they've got key things they have to deliver. And so I think one of the arts is to also go into their mind in, in the same concept of behavioural economics, mm -hmm. to understand their biases, understand where they're coming from, and then re-suppose, I guess, what we're really trying to do in their language. And I think the other key thing is to show faster outcomes yeah. and maybe even um, you know, tested outcomes, so not over-promising either, but, but quick, wins, yeah. quick wins, because I think that's where they get belief. I think it's all about belief. Yeah. You've got to almost make sure that yeah. you're doing that early, getting that quick win, creating the belief and then go to the next phase. I yeah. think sometimes I've seen practitioners go way too hard on the methodology and yeah. almost aim for perfection yeah. and get everyone aligned before we can even enter the ecosystem, which, you know, hardly ever happens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. Just get going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. I guess building on that idea of <coughs> sort of trying to think strategically and being pragmatic, all of you are managing, as we've heard, you know, teams that are trying to combine mm -hmm. all of these ideas and some of them seem to be like they're in their own units and then all mm -hmm. working towards that common goal. 
from, I guess, a, a management or strategic thinking perspective, what challenges have you experienced in trying to get everybody to come on board together and, I guess, work towards that, that end aim, which is to put the human first? I'd be interested in your thoughts, put in terms of how these disciplines have played yeah. together since they got in the same room. Yeah, actually, one of the uh, driving forces for us putting the team together, I mean, senior management saw it, but the, actually the, the, the people who worked on the projects also saw mm -hmm. it as well. Mm -hmm. They said, hey, I'm working on this problem, and I think you can offer me some insights. You know? so, so I think there was uh, already some pull uh, towards uh, one another uh, from that point of view. So it, it wasn't a very difficult argument. Uh, of course, when you put the team together, there'll be, uh, because they're different, they think differently, mm -hmm. so there'll be some uh, sometimes disagreement, but as mm -hmm. uh, Nina mentioned, it's, it's, it's not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. uh, as long, and we call the, the, the team, we call it co-lab, mm -hmm. collaboration lab, so <laughs> they have to collaborate. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> maybe that's, that's, uh, that's that some friend. behavioral <laughs> economics yeah. there as well. Yeah. Uh, so, so and, and the team work well together. When they disagree, they, they talk about it. And I suppose when it comes to designers, when it comes to um, 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 even uh, behavioral economics, uh, to them, <coughs> contradictions are not, not, uh, not unexpected and not mm -hmm. a bad thing uh, in terms of the DNA. So, so they, they work well together and they, uh, um, um, I think it helps also that the problems that we work together impact lives, right? We're not mm -hmm. just uh, sort of driving towards profits, uh, greater profits. Uh, we actually sometimes deal with life and death situations. We deal with how people retire adequately. So these are important issues. So that even when you have disagreements, you can put it aside and work towards those mm -hmm. important objectives. Mm -hmm. I think it's also about giving time. I think we're all human. We need to give time for things to form. Um, and when I was uh, speaking to my colleague Dean, um, the organisation we've done a lot of work with is the Basara Centre for Behavioural Economics. Mm -hmm. um, and it's actually been multi-year partnership. So I think what's really important about this is understanding. Sometimes it's within, you've got teams within, and it's also about the partnerships you create outside of your organisations. Um, and I really appreciated his candidness, which was, you know, it took a couple of years to kind of get it humming, right? Yeah, we're working on projects, you're doing it, but really understanding each other, working out that actually, um, you yeah, kind of understand where you're coming from now. And it's always in the heat of the moment, that's when it matters. I've observed my own design teams. We've got a, a few people on our, our team, um, even in Australia here, that bring expertise around behavioural economics and insights. And it's in the moments we're in the room and they're debating about, well, how should we actually design the research piece right now to understand behaviours? Like, it's in those moments that it counts. Mm. So how do you facilitate that dialogue? How do you actually open to that conflict, and I say that in a genuine way so that you can then get a shared understanding and be willing to let, you know, learn from one from the other, and I think that's where it succeeds in the long run, mm -hmm. is just giving it time and actually then building the relationships mm -hmm. and then designing the right process for the problem together, so. Mm -hmm. I think just to close out on, on that one, um, something that we've found really important is having a support network. So I hypothesise that many of you are here because you're behavioural insights, behavioural economists, and you've got these pesty people somewhere over there in another department or within your depart division go called human-centred design. You're like, I have to justify my, my being against mm -hmm. these people. Um, but what we've found, if you can't have them all together because you don't have a large enough department, for example, um, DHS are very blessed in terms of they're much further along their maturity path and they've got some scale. But what we've found important is to get your external networks in place. So we've done this on a number of levels. Um, we have, and some of you are probably participants in what we call heads of labs, for want of a better name. So when I came on board a couple of years ago, I'm like, where's my tribe? Where are my people? <laughs> and people said, well, I think it's about four of these labs kicking around. And there's at least 24 that we know of at the federal mm -hmm. government level. And that's only at the federal government level. Um, so I, I gathered them all together. These heads of labs, it was very organic at first and sort of said, what are we all doing? You know, we're all doing the same thing. And there's a lot of opportunities for synergies. We've now formalised that just in terms of reference and a future pipeline of work. So we work very closely hand in hand with our great partners at Behavioural um, Economics team at PMC, with the DTA, with our service designers, etc., to get a common narrative, but shared skill sets. And I think watch this space because we'll be doing some cool stuff in terms of 
whole of government. And I should also say mm. and tip my hat to our external suppliers that they are so critical. They're so critical in terms of when you are getting going and when you're scaling up especially um, in terms of having those skills, not someone who's read a book but someone who has done this stuff and, mm. you know, is a practitioner but also along the entire journey because you need fresh blood. You need people who have done this in banks, you know, the AMPs of the world. You need people who have done this in different sectors. So develop that ecosystem and including mm. academics. So we've got all that. So that's, that's another way mm. I think you mm. make it stick and they all mm. play together. That's yeah. right. Great. Uh, the only one I'd probably share is um, data is a challenge. Like I think it sometimes holds you back because with all good intent, you want to show the, show the values, show the outcome, sorry, and, and that's what gets you the scale tick to go, you can now go to scale, but then if that takes months, yeah. you may lose momentum. Um, I actually think this is an example where you can borrow something from design thinking. I think one of the concepts that mm -hmm. I love is that whole storytelling, mm -hmm. that actually sometimes you don't need 100 pieces mm -hmm. of evidence, mm -hmm. you just need a good story mm -hmm. to say, well, this is the why to get that scale tick off. And I think that's important, mm -hmm. and that's where we can mm -hmm. combine the two ones again yeah. to say, actually, the behavioral economics research is proven. Mm -hmm. Yes, you know, we need to do more work before we can share the economic outcomes and before we go to scale, but this is the story. These are the five mm. um, sort of personas we've dealt with and mm. you know, believe in it and let's go. So I think that's probably another challenge that sometimes data can be difficult and can take time, but let's not get held up by it. I think that's just to add on that. We had ABC Television came in yesterday for our comms team and for my design team and did strategic storytelling in business. That's our, our national broadcaster, television broadcaster. Fantastic. That is the number one thing we're pushing at the moment is storytelling. Whether it's data analytics, behavioural, everything, we're both telling a story. We're serving our ministers, for those of us in government, they want sound bites and they want human stories. So we can't underestimate how important that is. I think this particular question is interesting, which is, and Nina, you've touched on it a little bit, I think, in your kind of comparison about mm. design thinking versus BI. And mm. I thought it was interesting that, Jenna, you then pointed out that maybe it's also a matter of just qualitative versus quantitative. You know, maybe mm. the divide isn't as quite as strong as we think. Mm. Mm. How do we know when design thinking is working? Mm -hmm. As opposed to behavioral economics with, you know, say an RCT. I might ask, it's almost another clarifying question, which is, is it about the end game? Mm. Is that what we're talking about here? Because the concept of is it working is yeah. interesting because what you need to achieve change is more than just a great letter. Mm -hmm. That's one instrument. Mm -hmm. When it's a complex change, you need activation of a network of people. There's no such... Some things are one agency, one organisation can control an intervention point or a service. But when you're in a very complex process, I think what design is helping do initially is help stage the conditions that everyone is understanding what change is required to bring about the effect that you're actually after. Sometimes it might be a multiplicity of things you need to do, and therefore it might activate a number of different organisations and partnerships, not just government to government, but government to non-government. That's particularly evident in very complex spaces such as social services, domestic violence. But if you go into the hard end, like national security, you know, you're dealing with, and I say design thinking applied across the board here, um, you need to be able to activate people's understanding, get that social and you know, political will behind what your good idea is. Is it working in practice? I think that's a good question, which is anything you implement should have some sense of measurement around it. So design thinking, if it was just pure train of developing from an insight to an idea to piloting it, you would work, we work with academics to evaluate what were you looking for as the change from your intervention. So we did that when we looked at um, families in need in ACT a number of years ago, um, where we actually did independently. So I think it's important with any methodology you look potentially at independent people to evaluate your activity, and they are able to put in some report back to say the intervention you put in place is making a difference. We've seen these families now getting the services they need and so that was able to be, you know, attested. So that's how I'd answer it. it depends on how you actually structure your implementation. Yeah. I think maybe another way to, to ask that question is, is not whether it works or not because if you come up with a solution, I think intuitively you know that uh, for service delivery, for example, it, it will be a better service delivery. Um, I think the question is, how do you know that's the best solution? That you have not thought of other things? Mm. Um, because you're not collecting data, you're just talking to a few people. Um, so how do you know that what you, 
brainstorm was, and you came up with its ab absolutely best solution. And uh, actually, that applies to, to BI as well. Because mm. we look at BI and say that there's a lot of uh, data and so on, but the, you know, the interventions are also generated by human beings. You know, they're not, not, uh, there's no methodology to come up with the best solution. And I think the answer to, to, to that is that for both methods, actually, sometimes there is no absolute best solution. Mm. Uh, so, for example, for us, we have a service center that, that uh, um, deals with uh, tens of thousands uh, of complex cases a year. Um, and uh, people come down and they get served. Uh, and we, we did the first iteration of the improvement uh, through design thinking. And there was great improvement, right? queues get shortened and, and, and uh, dramatically, and people felt that they, was, they were being served better. But we felt that there were still weaknesses. Mm -hmm. And so we did, we're doing another round of design thinking again. Mm -hmm. And guess what? We found that actually there were certain things we could do better mm -hmm. that we did not so-called think about in yeah. the first round. But so it's, it's a continuous process. Uh, you may never ever arrive at the very best solution, but it's, it's always about getting better and hopefully mm -hmm. significantly better every mm -hmm. time. There's a great saying, you know, don't let greatness be the enemy of good in terms of if you're creating value, you're, you're moving ahead. You need to build those metrics into your design so you always know that you're measuring something. But it, it, it's interesting. I, I wonder if that's the real question that we're asking is mm -hmm. how do you measure um, design thinking when I've gone to so many of these types of conferences. The question really is, and it often comes from design thinking teams, how do I justify my existence? Um, or if you're behavioural economists, you know, we're looking to get design thinkers, how can I prove that we actually need that in there? So just be very careful of what it is you're trying to measure. Um, it takes time. System change <coughs> takes time. So I would break those metrics down um, in terms of, you know, sanction us off some acceptable risk parameters for a period of time and let us play within that sand pit type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, show that we've generated more ideas, show that we've killed more ideas, those sort of things. Set some metrics, but it, it takes time. So I just wonder if that's the right question that we're actually, or the real question that we're asking. Yeah, well, and that actually leads quite nicely into the sort of the next question on here, which is how do you get buy-in for something like design thinking within your organizations? I mean, obviously these are things that are kind of embedded where you're working now, but are you finding that you have to really make that value pitch over and over again? Is it getting easier? Um, do you need to try and get that buy-in even from your staff themselves, kind of building it bottom up? Um, Mukha, I'm not sure if you've got any thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I actually think even related to the last question, I look at it as different levels of maturity. So I think the first thing is to work out if you're dealing with a very immature organization, um, I wouldn't be going too hard on it's got to be measured, we're going to hold KPIs, we're going to align KPIs. That's best practice, but that's like, you know, the final layer of maturity. Um, for me, the, the way to look at that is um, you've really got to get buy-in from an intent and partnership model and not look at it as, oh, we've got all the answers, because that's the other thing people don't like, as, you know, that suddenly these guys are going to come in and tell us how the world in my, in my world should be doing and indirectly, implicitly calling out that we're not doing it correctly. Yeah. Um, so for me, um, the technique really is, once again, in the mindset of the person you're dealing with, what would good look like for them? How do we turn up as trusted advisors? How do we partner? And then one of the things I always tell my teams is, let's always put this in our initial pitch, that if we're successful, we, we, we shouldn't be needed mm -hmm. at all. Because actually, the teams can you know, grow BI practices, or they can grow design thinking. And that's a good thing. Let's not make this a competition. Mm -hmm. My view is, leave it behind. Because the more people are doing it, that's good news for us. We can go somewhere else in the department. And sometimes just saying that with intent, of course, um, um, gets a lot of buy-in because that means you're no longer this enemy. You're actually being brought into the camp to embed. So I think that helps, especially yeah. early in the journey. And, and I would say the last point is, um, for me, the key success right now is actually not even metrics or anything. It's more when I go into a project room when it's one of those planning or one of those multidisciplinary teams, how much is the insights, the customer, the behavioral economics turning up in decision making? Mm. And if it's not, then my thinking is, geez, how do we bring it in, in relevance, in sort of um, better decision making? Um, because even if I can get one, even one comment in, in the future, that's a good win. Then maybe 10, maybe 15. 
Um, but that's the way to think about it. Like, there's no, like, it takes a lot of difficulty to get people there. But I think going at it and starting to see those representations and discussions and, you know, you want to enter a room where they're really debating customer versus business outcomes and the trade-offs. That's when you know you're getting more mature. So for me, that's actually the results right now, that how much of the department across those 200 projects is actually talking about customer, how, how where are they using real insights and, and applied insights. That's the other bit. There's a lot of research, but sometimes no one even looks at it. It was a nice report, tick the box. But how do they actually apply it in a way that actually got a better result? So once again, they need sometimes help with that too. Not just the research, but how do they actually apply it well? And you so. guys are doing a really good job, I think, at DHS in terms of um, collating that learning over time in terms mm. of your units. You've got your users, mm. you've got user libraries mm. coming into play and everything, and it does depend where you're at in that maturity model yeah. as well. Um, I think what you said is very valid in terms of humility and how you um, position yourselves. And we've done really, really tactical, maybe they are nudges, I don't know. Um, in terms of how we speak about our role. So for example, we're called BizLab, and you come and do a project with us, but it's never our project. It's your pod project. You're the policy person for innovation or whatever. You present the project back to the business. You speak, we don't speak. It's not BizLab. It's just those little nuances that position you. And I, and I say I'm in the job of change management. I articulate that in the business as evolution management. I'm not here to blow up the place. And, you know, we are, as, as um, cliched as it might sound, standing on the shoulders of giants, of people who have done innovation pioneers, brilliant things for many, many years. We're not the new shiny bauble that will come and go. So humility mm. plays a big part in it, I think, positioning. I'll just say one comment one? Yeah. just very quickly on that question. In my experience, it's actually the leader who is able to articulate the complexity of the problem and what attempts have been done to date and why we need to do something different. Um, and so I actually, um, given I was in the public sector, so I cut my teeth as a guinea pig in design before it was even a concept at the tax office. So my whole PhD talks about that journey. I left and then I wrote about it for the next five years. Um, but what my observation is, um, leadership, either within a project or a problem space, is, is fundamental. Um, and where I see uh, quite impressive, and I, I admire the clients I work with, where they just take the time to find the space, to talk to the ministers to say, we need space to do good work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's applicable in our current dialogue here between design and BI, to say, give us that space to do that well. And it doesn't mean space multi-years, it's just space to at least start the process. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the articulation of the complexity needs a different approach than yeah. we've tried it in the past. Right. Yeah, what's opportunity yeah. cost? What's the, what's the cost of doing nothing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, I think we may have to go old school and we're just going to bring out a mic. Yeah. But I'd love, in these last uh, eight minutes, I think we might go to you now. If there are any last burning questions that you'd love to hear the panel discuss, they'll give really short, punchy answers before we wrap everything up and uh, let you go to lunch. So if you'd pop your hands up for me, and Lynn will come around. So we have one here, and then, sir, in the orange as well. Sorry, we'll go here, and then to here in the front. All right. Um, thanks. Joe uh, Artenzi, Sheep CRC. Um, Thanks, it's been a great viewing on this. I've kind of come in and taken over from a BI person who couldn't come, and I'm the DT. Um, <laughs> so um, I hope I can escape safely. Um, <laughs> my question is, uh, I get the sense that you're framing design thinking as qualitative no. and mm -hmm. BI as quantitative, because that seems to be where it's going. Can we sort of pull that apart a little bit? And I apologise if that reinforced what I was saying about qualitative and quantitative. And I think if you go back to that maturity model again, one of the biggest risks that you face in the beginning is this is all fluffy design thinking. And it's a whole lot of post-it notes. How can 20 people be statistically significant? If I have heard that one day, I've heard it every single day since I've been there. So it takes patience to get through the process to where you can actually use quantitative methods. And... I think it's important to note behavioural economics isn't the only quantitative method as well. There are a lot of other methods out there that can um, conjoin analysis, a whole lot of different things. You guys are practitioners, you know. But I would never personally, this is me personally, launch something all the way through without an element of data analytics or assessment from a quantitative measure. Mm. One more? Um, I just want to make a comment. I mean, look. Cultural ethnography, anthropology, has qual and con. 
right? It's actually from what yes. base in which you actually design your instrument. What are you trying to understand? And behavioural economics, behavioural insight, you are also qual and quant. Observations, yeah. observing what people do. So I think, again, it's the difference between a methodology, which has an epistemological view and different theoretical underpinnings, and then there's the methodology and there's the methods. And I, I do see, um, I think the benefit of actually having studied is that you respect that, uh, you know, in an academic paradigm, there's a difference between the conversations of method and methodology, and we just need to probably not mix the two. Yeah. Um, that way then we're actually going to be much more elastic in our application and, and be more productive, I think, around choosing the right, mm -hmm. the right methods. Yeah, that's um, a great question. Can I just jump to this gentleman here in the front? Here you are. Hi, thanks guys. Uh, Ash Donaldson from Tobias, we're a human centered design agency. Uh, I just wanted to, to uh, have a bit, bit of a comment on what you were saying, Hong, um, and that's uh, about the, the choosing the best solution. Uh, and the, the comment of continuously striving towards something, mm -hmm. continuously testing assumptions. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I see that, that is often a constraint against that in, in government and in uh, large corporate is the idea of, of projects. So I'm mm -hmm. getting funding for a project mm -hmm. and then it stops. Mm -hmm. um, and also just the concept of a business case. You have to start with a solution, yeah. get funding for it, and then go through it, we, we, which is kind of anathema to, to the, the design process. Um, mm. Where, I, I mean, you look at uh, Lewin, in his behaviour equation, he said behaviour is a function of a person and their environment. If yeah. you change the environment, it's going to change the behaviour. It's a complex system. Mm. There'll be intended consequences that you can measure, mm. uh, that you will be looking to measure, and then the, there'll be mm. unintended consequences. So you can always look for a better solution again. And so... If we can shift from uh, project to product and from business case to exploration spaces, mm. then we can continuously refine and improve and get better. Sure. Mm -hmm. Just comment. Yeah. Mm. Uh, now, maybe we'll take two more yeah, questions. Uh, Did you still have a question, sir? Um, so just uh, this gentleman here in the front, and then we might go, was there someone out the back as well? We'll go to the back, and then you will be our lucky last. No pressure. <laughs> Hello, I'm right Mike here. Daniels from the Behavioural Architects. Uh, just picking up on something you said, uh, Nina, uh, uh, it, it strikes me that you know a large part of what we've been discussing is the difference between something that is a methodology in design thinking and, mm -hmm. and something in behavioural science, I suppose, which mm -hmm. is, is simply, uh, you know, dare say simply, but it, it's about having discovered things that are real about mm -hmm. behaviour. So... Mm -hmm. I wonder what the panel's view is then on just that these, the kind of the premise of how could these two things <laughs> work together is not one of competing methodologies, but actually how can the exciting discoveries of behavioural science fuel a better design process mm -hmm. and make that more exciting? Mm -hmm. So just interested in your thoughts mm -hmm. in relation to that. Yeah, um, to us it's just uh, a toolbox mm -hmm. that you put in tools. Yeah. The different tools. It's, it's not so much... Uh, and when you fix your car or, or whatever, you do, don't just use one tool. And the different parts of the car, you may use different tools. Uh, even the same part in different times, at different times, you may use different tools. So for us, it's, uh, it's all about... That's why we, we framed it in UDT. Mm. To understand, then you, you use whatever tools to understand. To design, you use whatever tools to the situation to understand and test. Uh, same thing. You know, so so that's that's how we see it. We are, um, you know, you can say that we are problem centric, and I don't, I'm not an academic. We are not academic, so we, we are not trying to test how how effective the tool is. We're just trying to solve the problem. I think that's it. We've got to stop the dialogue between one versus the other. It's it's not a dialogue that gets us anywhere. And you know, you had a great chart in terms of typical. Uh, skill sets or, or professional backgrounds, you know, they both have sociologists. I work with anthropologists. There's social scientists. They're not separate that one is a science and one is just people getting in a room with post-it notes. Mm. We're still living, <laughs> observing, doing ethnography with our users. So, yeah. Uh, we might just pop to our last question and then we'll, we'll come around and give everybody a last uh, statement. Yeah? <clears throat> Hi, I'm Luisa Perez from the Natural Resource Access Regulator. And recently coming and transferring from academia to, to government, 
I wonder whether it's also uh, changing a paradigm, a, paradigm, a paradigm shift from thinking about solving problems, which is our end goal, to facing the problems. Mm -hmm. So my question goes, because I keep on hearing, you know, we have to say solve this, solve that, but then the problems are intrinsically complex. Mm -hmm. And one of the, if, if complexity is not a word that really helps for a lot of people, it did not help me, mm -hmm. think about wicked problems. You put a solution somewhere and you create a problem somewhere, somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question is, and that goes from, for like people who are trying to face reality, which is now my role now in life, or people who are thinking about it, how to do differently in terms of academia. So my question is, should it be something about, re not really whether it's, this is the right tool, this is the right tool, but it is perhaps even changing the way we phrase the prob the, the, what we do now from solving a problem to facing the problem. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's kind of like my last question. What are your thoughts on that? I'd love to hear from Mukul on this and then perhaps uh, mm -hmm. Nina as the other academic on the uh, Sure. Um, so I agree. I mean, I almost think it's, um, we should be inversing that anyway, like before getting into solving a problem. I mean, I think both methodologies say this actually. You want to face into it and really understand it in context and spend more time immersing in it before getting to the solution. So if anything, I think both say that. Um, um, so I agree. I mean, I actually think it's, it's more about that. I think it's absolutely more about that. And, and if anything, you can have a hypothesis. Once again, both say that. You can, it's good to have a hypothesis or a North Star in the case of design thinking, but then continually iterate towards that or be willing to change the hypothesis as you go along, which also comes from continuously understanding the context or exploring the problem in more detail. Mm. before coming up with the solution. So I actually think it's the inverse just by its nature. Mm. Yeah. Um, I'll answer this one from the perspective. I was um, lucky enough to be part of a, a group of about 25, um, I guess, practitioners, academics about a month ago. And the whole purpose of the multi-days was actually what methods reveal a system. So this point about complexity. And so one thing that we, we talked a lot about is but what perspective are we trying to understand the current state and where are we trying to go to? And so I think there's something very important about do we actually pay attention to the 20 year, the 30 year horizon, or are we paying attention to today's horizon in the current terms? The reason why I say that is because it's really critical to pay attention to the norms and what's happening now and the interactions and the patterns, but where do you want to go? So we talked about examples of when is it normalised for women to breastfeed in public? You know, when does that become a norm? So at some point it wasn't okay. So part of good problem framing is also what are you aspiring to achieve? even if there's a problem kind of in front of you, right? Because sometimes a problem itself needs to be explored and addressed, but it unearths a larger kind of opportunity for what you're actually trying to achieve. And so I think we need to be open enough to be pushing for those boundaries and looking to disrupt thinking, even if it's not been invited. A lot of people tell me, yeah, but the minister's given me the brief, or this is the project scope. Um, I think it's a responsibility of aiming for good outcomes for people and citizens that we start to think about where do we imagine things need to be so that we are then framing problems at kind of multi-levels of fractals. There are problem spaces for today that need efficiency, effectiveness, focus, absolutely. There are problems that need to be completely reframed and then we have to also look for possibility to, to completely disrupt. So my point about saying violence doesn't exist, your whole service wouldn't need to exist in the future what might we need to do, it's really important to be pushing those. And I think that gives people motivation to participate, gives them hope. And I think part of good impact is that you build in hope to people's systems and then you build the concrete actions to help test that. Amazing. Mm -hmm. All right, 10 seconds each. Mm -hmm. Your key takeaway for the audience as they walk out and get their lunch, which I promise I will let you go to. <laughs> uh, we'll start with Poon. Let's start with Nina. <laughs> <laughs> no, just, just, just say I agree. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, I got me to say, yeah. then you'll say you agree. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Um, Good strategy. Nina, do you have a key takeaway for the audience? Um, I think keep asking the questions, seek the contradictions, and embrace it, and have fun. Thank you. Yeah, have fun, definitely. When in doubt, just come and ask. Talk to people. Don't get caught up in the academics of this versus that. Just make connections, talk to people, help figure out what the best approach is. Right tool for the job. It's the bottom line for me. Yes. Well, I guess same thing. How can you not have fun when you're disrupting and experimenting? Yeah. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> <laughs> <Thank you. laughs>